All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning on our webinar series for the Cyber Threat Alliance. I'm Michael Daniel. I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance. We are a consortium of 27 cybersecurity providers that have agreed to share threat intelligence with each other. Uh, this morning, I've got uh, Rick Howard here with me from the CyberWire. Rick, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, like I said, my name is Rick Howard. I'm the chief security officer for the CyberWire. I'm also their senior analyst, and um, I'm working on cybersecurity podcasts these days. Great. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, Rick. We really appreciate it. Um, I think, you know, some of what we wanted to talk about today is a concept that you and I have talked about uh, in many different environments um, before, um, but why don't we actually start with, uh, you know, kind of what the adversary playbook idea is and um, where, you know, where did it come from? Yeah, we've had this notion uh, for a long time now, all right, that adversaries, in order for them to be successful penetrating their victims' networks, it isn't just one thing that they do. They have to string a bunch of actions together in order to be successful. They may be successful at various phases of that, but they aren't completely successful unless they can get all the way through all those attack sequences. Uh, this was made famous by uh, the Lockheed Martin research team back in 2010, their famous paper on uh, the intrusion kill chain paper that by the way, everybody should have read by now, okay? Uh, where they realized that that was the fact that uh, if you understand that there's various phases that adversaries have to work through, that you could actually put prevention controls at every phase of that attack sequence. So instead of just having one control in place for like say a piece of malware that we knew, uh, we would have multiple prevention controls in place for a specific adversary. And thus you would exponentially increase your chances uh, to uh, defeat an adversary coming after you. So that's been the idea for the last you know, 10 years, right? And we have struggled as an industry uh, to try to get that done. We all recognize that's probably the right way to do it, uh, but the mechanics of making that happen has been difficult for us. Yeah, and I think the the other piece of it, of course, is that the bad guys aren't gonna just like actually hand us their um, playbooks. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> They're not going to tell and, us how to do it? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, nor are they going to, of course, actually, uh, and in many cases, right, they don't even, I mean, if you actually could interview some of them, they would say, I don't have a playbook. You know, right. I just get on the computer and I do stuff. It's not like they've got a written down plan. Um, so, like, as we think about this, how do we actually determine what the adversary playbooks actually are? Well, I, I, there's one distinction I'd like to make too. This is not um, attribution, okay? We are we don't care, at least I don't care, that it's the Russians or the Chinese or my neighbor down the street. It doesn't matter to me who it is. What I'm trying to do is prevent that, whoever it is behind it uh, from being successful. So what we are trying to collect is the techniques and procedures that those bad guys use to negotiate the intrusion kill chain. So we have to be able to collect that, all right, figure out what it is, and then devise prevention controls for the security stack that we already have in place in our own environments, right? So uh, th those are the, that's the um, the big problem that we have to solve. Yeah, I, think, I don't know if that answered your question, Michael. Did, I think I went around the horn on that one. What, what did you, What did you ask me specifically? <laughs> well, I think you know I, the. I mean, I think the right the the piece of it that we're trying to get at is you know uh, even if an adversary and doesn't think they have a playbook, right? That we know that they're still human, and yeah. humans tend to fall into patterns and they tend to repeat the same sequence of activities because that's mentally easier, right? You're not gonna make up a new approach to every single target that you go after. Yeah, um, well, why just, would you? You know, yeah. you know, why would you re try to in reinvent everything from scratch every time you have a new victim? That doesn't make any sense. And I think, you know, the reason that it feels like there are a gazillion adversaries out there doing everything is that the adversaries can automate many of these things for themselves and launch them at multiple victims. So were, were you right, Michael, they might not say they have a playbook, but they have automation in place that is essentially their playbook, right? Um, and so it, uh, 
that is the um, the and the reason that it feels like it's so big is that they've automated those attacks. Uh, what I like to talk to the network defenders around the world is just asking them how many adversary groups do you think there are out there? And by the way, nobody knows the answer to this. We have some guesses, but um, when you ask a big crowd about that, most people think it's gigantic. There must be millions of adversaries out there. Um, but the consensus of the Cyber Threat Alliance researchers, right? It's pretty small. You know, it's probably less than a hundred adversary groups that are active on the internet on any given time. They may run multiple playbooks, you know, so the same researchers in the Cyber Threat Alliance think there's maybe 500 um, active adversary campaigns on the internet on any given day, right? And so when you think of it that way, that's a solvable problem. It isn't infinite, right? It's 500. You could probably track all 500 campaigns in the spreadsheet if you wanted to, right? right? Um, but I wouldn't advise it, but you could do it. It's that small, right? Um, so. I don't know. I, I kind of ran off the rail again. What was the question I was supposed to be answering? No, but I, think, but I think that's actually an interesting point, right? Which is that, you know, and if you compare it to the physical world, I mean, we know, like, if you ask any beat cop, right, they will tell you that most of the crime in any given area is actually committed by a fairly small number of miscreants, yep, right? Yep. That, um, and that if you can, you know, identify those particular miscreants, then you can actually make a, a, an impact in uh, the level of cyber crime, uh, level of crime in a given area. And I think the same thing is true on the internet. Um, and what you were talking about is is very much the case that the reason that it, the scale seems so big is because the automation makes it easy to scale up. Um, and so the result is that. Um, what 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 seems like a really huge number of bad guys is really actually a much smaller number of them. Um, you know, I think the other thing that you know the one the one criticism that I think is legitimate on the the Lockheed Martin kill chain, right, is that the bad the these playbooks are not necessarily are not necessarily completely linear, right? It's not sure. A to B to C to D to E because they do pivot and make changes based on what they discover in uh, a victim's um, you know, network. Uh, oh, they're running this operating system, so I'm now going to deploy you know, this snort flabulator as opposed to that one over there. Um, so Not the snort flabulator, oh my God. God. I yes. hate that when I see that on my network. <laughs> that's, that's the terrible one, right? So. <laughs> Well, I always um, refer to the intrusion kill chain because uh, the Lockheed Martin one because they were first. There are literally right. hundreds of versions of that thing out there now, uh, more detail in some, less detail in others. Right. Um, uh, and the one, uh, the standard that's come out of that, though, is the MITRE attack framework, right? Right. Which seems to be the thing that everybody has globbed onto that says, oh, yeah, okay, I saw the intrusion kill chain idea. The MITRE attack framework is a way we can take that idea as a theory and actually implement it uh, internally for all of our systems. Yeah, and I think the um, when you look at like now that framework, right, MITRE ATT&CK is really sort of, it, it's really being well developed and they're starting to develop versions of it, you know, for business IT systems, for industrial control systems, for, you know, the different flavors, which I think will make it even more, um, even more useful. Um, and I think the, I mean, the other piece of this, right, of course, is that since nothing is static on the internet, you know, it's not like you can sort of sketch out the, you know, adversary playbooks that you're facing, um, you know, print them out, uh, and have them in binders on your, you know, <laughs> over your desk, right? Because they're going to, they're going to change, um, at a pretty regular, uh, at a pretty regular interval. So you do have to keep up with what the, with what the adversaries are doing. Well, that's why the, the premise of the Cyber Threat Alliance is so compelling, right? Because if we are trying to manually, as a network defender, as a chief security officer, if I'm trying to manually keep up with the automation that the adversaries are using, I'm never gonna win that fight, ever. I had a, my old boss at Palo Alto Networks, Mark McLaughlin, he always used to say, the network defender community is bringing people to a software fight, okay? And we're never gonna, Never going to win that. Do you know what movie that's a reference from? No, wait, no. Uh, uh, the Untouchables. <laughs> the Untouchables. You should. You shouldn't bring a knife to a gunfight. All right. So right. 
<laughs> so that's what he always said. And he's totally right. We have to automate our response to how the adversaries change their attack campaigns. And, and automating that is, there's a couple of different pieces to that, right? One is uh, you have to first automate the consumption of the intelligence so that there's not a person reading PDF files or emails or spreadsheets, you know, trying to manually go through all that stuff. Right? And then the second thing you have to do is automate the response to it. So whatever security stack that you have, uh, you should be able to put prevention controls for that intelligence right into that security stack without having uh, to put a man in the loop. And uh, that's the that's the real power, I think, of the Cyber Threat Alliance. Yeah. I think the other piece that, you know, you often hear is, so like if you're the CISO or the chief security officer for, you know, a mid-sized trucking firm in Iowa, like what what is this adversary playbook idea sort of do for, what, what does that do for me, you know? Um, yeah, and I, I get that question a lot, especially for small to medium-sized companies, you know, they don't have the resources to build a giant intelligence team who can track adversaries, you know, and and do all that stuff. So what can... Uh, a small organization with few resources do, they should, they should, if it, whatever security tools they buy, they should buy someone, all right, who adheres to the adversary playbook model, all right? And it just turns out that all the members of the Cyber Threat Alliance, uh, that's the philosophy. So they, if you aren't, you should absolutely pursue vendors who are in the Cyber Threat Alliance because they are sharing this kind of information on a real-time basis and they believe in the adversary playbook model. Yeah, I think the the other piece is that I think it's something that, you know, ironically, governments do in most other areas. You know, I spent a long time, uh, you have a history with, uh, you know, service and government. I spent a long time with the U.S. federal government. And in most other areas, um, if you think about counterterrorism or, you know, uh, countering weapons of mass destruction or a lot of the other things that governments do, like they do this. They actually figure out what are the bad guys thinking about, what are their techniques, how are they going to do it, and they come at it very much from that direction. Like cybersecurity is like the, the exception to that rule yeah. um, in the government, and it, it, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I think you know, some of it is that cybersecurity came out of such a technical discipline Right. It, it came out of this idea that it was all about the ones and zeros and therefore was not about the humans and the way that humans think. Um, and I think that's one of the key lessons that that I think we've learned over the last. Well, we're still learning it, but I think that many of us yeah. have really come to understand over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years is that it's really um, it's really not, in fact, about the computers. It's about the humans. Um, and well, and like you said, Michael, it's totally, you know, you understand why we've come from it that way. All the network defenders that I know, you, me, everybody in the Cyber Threat Alliance, everybody, most of us came up through the technical ranks, right? And, you know, and it's easier for us to focus on that piece of malware, okay, or that new piece of ransomware, because I can pull it apart. I don't have to talk to anybody. I can be in my dark room with my jolt cola and my pizza, and I can do all that interesting research, all right? And then I say, oh, look. You just have to do these five things to stop this piece of malcode from working, right? And that's all valuable research. I'm not saying it's not, okay? But it doesn't get to the point that we want to stop the adversaries from being successful, not stopping a piece of malware that's trying to run across on your network. Yeah, and this is something that I talk about when I talk to um, C when I talk to CEOs and other policymakers. That one of the one of the traps that we've fallen into, and I hear this repeated over and over and over again, is that, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a defender, I've got to be right 100% of the time, and the attacker only has to be right once. And my argument is that's actually thinking about it incorrectly, because, in it's fact, wrong. as you, yeah, yeah, as you, wrong. As, yeah go ahead. as you pointed out at the beginning, the attacker's actually got to go through an entire sequence, all of which has to work. Yeah. Right. And and actually, as a as a defender, I don't care where I break their intrusion chain. Right. If I keep them out of the network, that yes, that might be the best. But if they get in and they still can, and they can't move anywhere, okay. If yeah. They who can cares? Get in and if they can right. move, but they can't get to anything interesting, okay, I still win. Right. You know. And and if you start thinking about it at that way, you can all, very easily as a defender get five or six bites at the apple. Um, 
and that's a much better place, you know, to to be. But it requires a mental shift um, in how we think about doing network defense. I'm so glad you brought up that because that's been a, a you know a, a mantra of the security professionals forever. We have to get everything right, and the bad guys only have to do th- you know do it one time. What is completely wrong, right? Uh, you know, the average number of actions in an adversary campaign is somewhere between 50 and 100 steps. You know, somewhere along the intrusion kill chain. So all we have to do as network defenders is break up one of those, and they are not successful. Now, what we want to do is put multiple uh, blocks in place because the adversary is going to react to what we do. They're going to try to change some things out. All right. So we want to be able to make sure that as they are working on the new thing that's going to get around our other block, that the other things in place are going to stop them from being sexful if successful if they ever figure it out. Because what you said at the beginning is true. If there's 100 steps in the adversary's attack sequence and they went from victim one and they were successful, now they're moving to victim two. They don't change everything out in that attack sequence. They may have to change out, you know, the delivery piece or the command and control piece, but they're not going to change everything out. So if I have prevention controls in place for everything I know about that adversary, those are still legitimate, even if they change out a piece of their attack sequence. Yeah, and I think the it, it really is a different way of looking at the problem and when you when you start doing that that gives you a lot more options uh, as well right and it allows you to move beyond the the castle and moat um approach to much more of a of a layered defense uh, model and that is a much more successful uh way to think about the the problem um and of course i mean i think the other piece of this that um it, is really you know is really important is that if you if you have this understanding and this way of approaching it, then you can also do a better job of reacting when you have a bad day, right? It puts you in a better position to uh, identify that something is actually going wrong, that you can marshal your forces, if you will, for you know uh, incident response and recovery much more you know much more effectively. Well, I agree with that, right? So if I know that I have 20 prevention controls in place for, you know, panda, Chinese, kitten, okay, whatever we want to call it, right? And I see activity for one of the things that panda, Chinese, kitten does, I still have confidence that I can, uh, that I'm going to prevent their success because I know those other controls are in place, even if this is a new thing from Panda Chinese Kitten, right? So uh, that is the reason that the adversary playbook model is a better way to think about defending your enterprise. And, you know, and, and by the way, you know, in the last five years, being a network defender has, has become even more exponentially complex. You know, when just five years ago, we were mostly worried about perimeter defense. You know, we didn't really have, most people weren't in the cloud yet. Most people weren't using SaaS applications yet. Um, most people weren't allowing uh, their employees to use their personal devices um, to do work. Uh, and that is all almost completely changed, right? Uh, and so before it was hard to do what we were talking about just when you were you know, trying to protect your own enterprise behind the perimeter. Now you got to do it across all these data islands. And uh, if you don't automate that, if you're trying to do that manually, um, there's no way that you can keep up with the advanced adversary. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, now in the, particularly in this sort of COVID world, right, where you've got a huge percentage of your workforce working from home. And and I really think that, you know, I mean, I've started to hear from colleagues that, you know, that situation is not going to change even when, um, even when the pandemic subsides, right? Um, that, however long that takes, but a lot of companies have discovered that having their workforce uh, not in the office can bring some benefits, right? And so we're going to be dealing in a world where there's a lot more people working from home in a lot less secure environments. And I think we're going to have to, uh, you know, start to recognize that. And again, it's just going to make the, the network defender's job a lot harder, you know, plus which we're also going to do things like, you know, we're going to keep hooking up more and more um, stuff, you know, ring cameras and nests and, you know, your coffee pot and your car and everything else. And, you know, that, again, all of those systems are different. Most of them have very little security built into it. So, you know, 
I, you're making I a point. I was, make, yeah. I was listening to this great podcast this week. It's called uh, The Land of the Giants, and they're going through the big internet uh, providers like Amazon and Netflix and Google and just talking about, you know, what their plans are and how they're doing stuff. They're talking about Amazon and how their goal is to get, you know, is it Alexa? Is that their, is that yeah, their yeah, robot, right? right? Yeah. Get Alexa everywhere in your house. Okay. And so that little device is going to be everywhere in the next five years. And so there's no security problems with that. I'm sure. No, I mean, I, you know, we, we promised some sci-fi references, but that just like goes like so like there's, <laughs> you know, Blade Runner, you know, whatever dystopian future you can. 1984. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. I, I could see it. it used to be that was a well, that's maybe that it might happen. But, you know, in today's world, 1984 is like maybe in three years from now. So yeah, right. <laughs> I'm very, very frightened by that. So, Michael, talk to me. Here's the thing I like about the Cyber Threat Alliance, though, in terms of an information sharing organization, right? Because uh, we've been sharing threat intelligence as a community since, you know, 1999, you know, when the first ISACs popped up. Um, but that's all been manual and voluntary. And the thing that makes the Cyber Threat Alliance different in this regard is that you have to share. So can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the ways that we, so there's there's actually several aspects of um, the Cyber Threat Alliance in that sense that I think are, are a little bit different. Um, you know, one is that, A, it focuses not on the end users, but on the cybersecurity providers, mm -hmm. right? And, and I use that term very broadly, like it's not just pure play cybersecurity companies, it's, it's anybody who's actually providing cybersecurity services to, to others. Right. Um, but that that focus on the that part of the community is actually not a place where a lot of the information sharing organizations existed before CTA. Um, so ironically, you had, you know, the bank sharing, the healthcare community sharing, the energy sector sharing, but not the cybersecurity community sharing in an organized way. Um, not the and vendor, then the other right? Yeah. You mean the vendor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the vendor community. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that CTA focuses on that that part. But you're right. One of our one of our business rules is that if you want to be part of CTA, you have to share. Um, we've and you know, be, um, being the cyber nerds that we are, of course, we've developed like this algorithm and there's this point system. But you know, the 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 key thing about it is that the the underlying business rule is that everybody has to contribute. Um, and everybody has to contribute in a standard format that can easily be shared amongst everybody else. Um, and that if you contribute, though, you get access to what everybody else is, is sharing. Um, and you can do this at speed and you can do it at scale. Um, you know, we're to the point now where, you know, we're, we're well up over 150,000 indicators a day moving through, um, moving through our platform. Um, and that number has been steadily trending upward as more members come on board and as our current members figure out how to automate more of their contributions to, uh, to CTA. Um, you know, the, so that, 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 and we've also figured out how to do this and uh, look at this from both the automated side and from the human side. Because again, I always think the human side is important. And so we are, you know, we are, we are constantly looking for ways to improve the ability of our members to collaborate with each other inside CTA. Then they can go, you know, then they can go out fiercely compete with each other in the outside world like we want them to do, um, you know, because we're good, you know, free market, leaving that. <laughs> um, but, you know, inside the alliance, they can, they can collaborate with each other and, and figure out ways to, you know, better protect uh, everyone in the whole, um, everyone in our entire digital ecosystem. Um, well, I think that was the big, the big insight yeah. when you formed the CTA many years ago now, was it been six, seven years? How long has it been going on? Right. So the, I mean, as an informal sharing group, it's been, um, you know, over six years now. Um, yep. As a formal nonprofit, it's about three and a half years. So, so the big insight though was, you know, used to be before we, the Cyber Third Alliance was started that many vendors thought that the thing that brought their product value was the intelligence they collected, 
Uh, and what we managed to change everybody's mind about was that's not the thing that's valuable, right? The, the thing that's valuable is how you protect your customers from it. And that most of the security vendors have uh, decent intelligence teams that corral and collect intelligence. And for depending on what their product is, they see different parts of the adversary elephant. So it made sense then that uh, to uh, help the entire community, to help our communal customers, because vendor one in the alliance has the same customers as vendor two does, because there's multiple uh, tools in your security stack. It totally made sense for vendors to share that information and not compete on the actual intelligence they collect, but compete on how well their products protect their customers. Yeah, and that's very much, to me, that's very much a, from a, uh, to go back to my public policy roots, that is <laughs> very much the public policy that we want to be promoting, right? You want to drive that competition up to a higher level in the value chain. Right. Um, and we would much rather have our cybersecurity vendors competing on, you know, how they protect their customers, how effective they are, how good they are at using the intelligence. That's a much better uh, level of competition, much more beneficial to society as a whole than competing on, I know something the other guy doesn't know, or as I like to say, my inadequate pool of data is bigger than her inadequate pool of data, so go with me. <laughs> I mean, you know. Um, that's, that's exactly uh, right. Yeah, so I mean, uh, as a chief security officer, right, it doesn't make any sense to me that you would choose a vendor who is not sharing threat intelligence with the other vendors. It, it because that makes the entire community better. So if I'm using vendors one through five, and I'm gonna pick a new vendor this year for some new capability, right? It doesn't make sense that you would pick someone who doesn't actively pursue this kind of sharing arrangement. It doesn't hurt you at all to pick them, right? It makes the entire community better, all right? And so I would highly encourage anybody out there buying new tools that they should first seek uh, members of the Cyber Threat Alliance, right? To see if they will be adequate enough for your needs. Uh, well, I, you know, just in the couple of minutes that we have left, I think the, you know, the one concept that that I'm very much focused on now, you know, a, as we put the, as we build these adversary playbooks, as we come to an understanding of the attack sequences that are used against us, you know, I very much want to um, take the fight to the bad guys. And I think that the place where we need to go is to build on this shared threat intelligence to uh, move towards operational collaboration um, so that you know governments and nonprofits and cybersecurity providers and others with a lot of capability are actually able to um, coordinate and collaborate on actions that disrupt what the adversaries are doing. And so that, you know, if we combine those uh, actions that governments can, by the way, I will now do my public service announcement. I am not talking about hackback. Hackback is a stupid idea. Yeah, um, you and I concur. That really yeah. dumb idea. <laughs> right. Do not do it. Um, but this is about the private sector working with governments who do have the authority to do uh, a lot of uh, offensive activities, right? And you combine those with what the defender community can do. Um, simultaneously and, and line those sequences up in time and you can actually start to have an ad, an impact on the adversary um, at a much more strategic level. Um, and you can begin to, um, you can begin to actually impose some costs on them in a way that would, you know, really uh, start to reduce the efficacy of, of cybercrime, for example. So that's so where I, I think we need to head. I, I really like that idea, and, and I would encourage everybody to take a look at what the Cyber Threat Alliance sharing platform is, right? and the, the way we are collecting data, and it will be better for the entire community to get on the same standard so that we can share information freely. At some point, we're gonna to wanna to be able to share whatever the Cyber Threat Alliance has with whatever the government has easily. All right, with whatever the FSISAC has, with whatever the healthcare ISAC has, right? Right now it's still too manual and still too slow. So I would encourage anybody that's involved in those organizations to figure out how to work together. That doesn't mean we have you have to abandon how you do it, but we need to start building bridges uh, between the two groups so that we can facilitate that information sharing. And then what Michael said, if you get that all done, then defeating adversaries 
uh, is possible, right? And no longer worry about, you know, that little piece of malware that's running around that no one's seen before. Yeah. Well, Rick, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to uh, join me this morning on this uh, this webinar, this chat. Um, it's always it's always entertaining to uh, to talk to you. So. Thank you, sir. Thanks for giving me a platform to uh, spout my crazy ideas. I always love that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> we know that, and that's why we invited you. So. <laughs> But thanks to everyone in the audience who uh, who tuned in. We plan to keep this webinar series going. Um, we've got a couple that, you know, some presentations that I've done, a conversation with Derek Mankey from Fortinet, and there will definitely be more to come. So look forward to uh, look, look out, be on the lookout for those announcements as they are to come. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody.